Welcome to the West Hearts College podcast series, The Industry in Isolation. Each week we'll be speaking to various professionals across the creative industries to answer student questions and to find out what the secret is to their success. Hello Stephanie Hackett, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm not too bad, thanks. Staying yeah. inside as, as we're meant to be. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, so uh, Steph is here today to talk to us about working as a performer in the industry. We've got a lot of questions to, to get through that you've all been asking and she's raring to go. We will uh, crack on then. So we're going to start with questions about training and how you got into performing. So, um, well, I guess that is our first question. How did you get into theatre and performing arts? Um, oh goodness, how did I get into it? Well, it was something that I'd always, I think like most performers, been interested in since I was a kid, you know. Um, I started off, my mum took me along to the local village hall and I did dance classes um, sort of once a week when I was about three year old, you know, pretending to be a fairy and a goblin and all sorts. Um, and I sort of stuck with that. Um, and then sort of when I was older, um I then sort of got into drama I used to go to a drama club just an after just a general sort of after school club uh once a week that was sort of one once I got into secondary school um and then sort of later on I, I then obviously studied drama at, at a level um and that was it probably wasn't until then that I sort of really started to take it seriously and think oh might this be something that I would want to do as a career when you got to that point uh kind of doing GCSEs A levels mm. uh, we had to make a decision what advice was there out there for you in terms of drama school or university you know did, did people know about the whole system no I didn't because I, I suppose I didn't go to sort of a specialist um sort of performing arts college I, I feel like sort of there weren't as many courses that were accessible um I mean, I'm not, I'm not going back that far, maybe 15 years or so, but there weren't, um, as, sort of, as far as I was aware, there, there weren't that many courses that were sort of specialist performing arts courses um, at a sort of A-level, sort of B-tech um, sort of standard. So I, I went and did um, sort of my academic A-levels. Even in terms of like drama schools, I was... I did a lot of research myself as in sort of I looked online and um, tried to look at different different courses um, and because I because I danced sort of since I was a kid I was certainly looking at musical theatre as opposed to sort of a straight acting course um, in terms of just like the knowledge of what the different colleges uh, were and and what the courses that they offered were I didn't feel like there was a huge amount of knowledge around it I guess no, I think that's something I can definitely relate to. I mean, I yeah. I didn't do a BTEC or anything like that I, either. I did A-levels. It's quite interesting now to see the difference with our students about how much they know. I guess they do go to a college that is very much about you will go into this industry. But yeah, yeah, it, it's quite a different um, idea, I think. Um, so where did you end up training and uh, what was it like? So I went to Italia Conti for three years uh, on their musical theatre course. Um I really, I really did enjoy it. There were, don't get me wrong, of course, there were struggles along the way, as as you get with everything, with it, any, you know, anywhere you go. Um, there are obviously going to be ups and downs, um, but on the whole, yeah, I did, I, I did enjoy my training. Although it was a musical theatre course, mm. um, I was able to focus more on acting because actually, sort of maybe halfway through my first year or something. I realised that actually perhaps musical theatre wasn't quite the right route for me. Mm. Um, although I'd sort of, you know, danced since I was a young age and I can, can certainly move, I wouldn't consider myself a dancer as in ain't nobody going to be casting me in a chorus line anytime, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and similarly, like, with singing, I can I can sing and I can hold a tune, but again, I'm not going to be playing alphabet anytime soon, mm. which, which is fine. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I dealt with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I did feel like the college allowed me to 
put more of my um more of my time into acting which was actually something that I was like oh actually I'm I'm all right at this I'm I'm a lot better at this than I am at singing and dancing um and I guess there were a lot of schools out there where if you do do a musical theatre course some are more sort of heavily dance based mm. and some are more heavily singing and acting based and I and I did feel that uh, at Sally Ponty I did feel like it was quite rounded sort mm. of across the board which was nice um so yeah so I, d- I did yeah I had quite a nice time there what was the audition process like? I think a lot of our students are just dipping into that world of having to audition for lots of different drama schools and, you know, yeah. getting the nerves and not really knowing what to expect. So what was your audition process like? Um, there, I Obviously, I, I auditioned for other colleges as well. I, I, I tried for Lane Theatre Arts and um, Bird College, um, which were both quite heavily dance-based. Um but my audition for Conti's was, oh gosh, let me remember, I had to prepare, I think I had to prepare two solo dances, um, and we also did classes during the day when we were there. Um, from what I can remember, did we do a jazz class? I think we had to do a jazz class and then prepare our own, oh goodness, ballet and tap pieces perhaps, uh, two contrasting songs um, from a musical theatre repertoire. I have a feeling I might have had to do two monologues as well, again, sort of contrasting. Each college is, you know, different and will require different things. But a, a sort of a, a general thing, I think it's good to have, you know, a couple of good contrasting songs that will show your range, um, mm. show different, you know, acting through song elements. And that'd be a really good thing to have. Um, and a couple of good monologues under your belt as well. Cool, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, any good stories about your time at, at Conti or at, you know, in your Lanes audition or anything? One of my most favourite memories from Conti's actually was we were set the task when we were in second year by one of the drama teachers to write and then perform to the rest of our year our mm-hmm. own one person show. Oh, wow. But when we were first told about it, we were all absolutely terrified. Um, <laughs> of having to sort of create it only had to be sort of five minutes long it wasn't you know a two-hour epic musical um but it it needed to contain um you know some singing dance and and acting elements um and honestly we were all absolutely terrified and then the day came so you know you sat there one by one and everybody's getting up and showing their work um but actually thankfully (laughs) um mine mine went down all right and yes, that was that was probably one of my favourite memories was just sort of working independently for the first time and sort of creating something um, from scratch. So that was probably one of my, my proudest little moments that I had. That sounds <laughs> amazing. Yeah, it was it was yeah, it was a fun project to do. It was cool. Nice. Well, in that case, uh, I guess the next question would be, has that actually helped you at all in your career? You know, have you ever come across an opportunity where you've had to do something similar? Yeah, I have actually. And I think not not even necessarily creating something completely on my own, but I mm. feel like more and more now, you know, people are getting together and they are creating their own work because it's it's hard. There isn't, you know, there's, there isn't, unfortunately, a huge abundance of work for actors. Mm. Um, so I think it's great that people are coming together and, yeah, and creating their own work and, and quite often I see a lot of um people looking for people to collaborate with um in sort of R&D projects um so yeah so I, th- I think I think it has helped me a bit yeah and I've also I've just I've, I've just, it's sort of given me a little bit of confidence just to try new things I mean I've, I've tried not that I class myself as a writer but you know one day I thought oh, I'll sit down and just give it a go I mean nobody's oh, why not? ever seen the script that I have written but I just thought, well, why not? Give it a go. What did you actually study day to day at Conti? Talk me through kind of a, a typical day. A typical day. Um, so we usually start the day off with a dance class. So maybe ballet or jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, you probably have a couple of singing classes in there. So you might have a song repertoire class. Um, which was just about, you know, getting the songs into your repertoire, building them up, learning learning new songs. Um, and then I might have like a, an acting through song class, which, you know, sort of explains itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and then drama classes, and they would be focused on 
all sorts, everything from learning about different practitioners, you know, your Stanislavski, your Brecht, um, to uh, modern day sort of playwrights, um, uh, reading new scripts, improvisation, you know, we do, we covered a whole host of things. Oh, I'll tell you one class I did really enjoy actually at Conti's. We used to have once a week a screen acting class. Oh, wow. That re- Yeah, I found that really helpful. Um, so we would be we would be filmed every week in class, you know, whatever we were working on at the time. Yeah. Um, and then it would be a case of watching that back and we'd be critiquing things and trying to pick up techniques um, that were specific to camera work as opposed to stage work. That sounds brilliant. Yeah, that was, it was nice. It was good. So that just picking up on one of the classes, especially that you mentioned there, um, the singing rep class. Mm. Um, a lot of our first year students are now just starting um, very remotely yeah. um, to create their own rep folders. So what do you think um, goes into choosing the right kind of song? Obviously, you've got to go across genres, across eras. Um, you know, What tips would you have for trying to wheedle out what songs work for different people? I think it's good, first of all, to have a a good range of songs so you, you know you, you do need everything from your you know your sort of more classical musical theatre like your Rodgers and Hammerstein right up to modern day contemporary musical theatre a lot of um castings I've found as well are asking for like pop or rock songs as well so it's sort of good to have some of those as well um but in terms of finding songs for you it's it can be tricky don't get me wrong because it's there's such a you know a wealth of material out there it's how where do you start trying to whittle it down um I tend to start with something that I like something that I enjoy singing and also things like obviously the, the character's age and things like that um so you know I'm, I'm not going to go in and, and sing a song that isn't necessarily suitable to my own casting I think, I think the same applies you know, between monologues and songs. Um, and then also, you know, think of the the vocal quality that you have, whether you, you know, uh, where you're, you're more comfortable singing a more sort of classical sound as opposed to a sort of a, a contemporary belty sound. Um, mm-hmm. You know, find songs that are going to suit your voice. Um, think about your vocal range as well. You know, don't try, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself where I picked a song which is way too high for me. But I think, oh, yeah, the adrenaline will get me through and it doesn't. As you mentioned earlier, you trained in musical theatre for the first few years. And then um, I know you told me before that you switched or you specialised rather in acting from the second year or is it the third year? Third year. Yeah. Third year. So what kind of prompted that switch and has that had much of an impact on your career, specialising in one over the other? For me personally, yes, it has. Um, the, The... It wasn't so much a sort of a course switch, but we had the opportunity when we were in our third year to take part in either a a, for one of our performance modules, um, a Shakespeare play, um, a singing concert or a dance show. Um, So I I went for the Shakespeare. But by I mean, by that point in my training, I was firmly wanting to go down the route of straight acting. So for me, that was a sort of a no brainer. Uh, You know, I was I was always going to do the Shakespeare. And yeah, I, I do think that has had, uh, it, it just, because, because I was then doing a, a lot more acting lessons than I was anything else. And I was, you know, the way that you work with the director was probably different from the way that the dancers worked with their choreographer and the director of their show. So it was just about sort of honing your skills and, and finding where you wanted to focus your career. Okay, so... What's the best piece of advice that you would give someone who's looking to go to drama school then, like you? I think, and I, and I don't mean this to put anybody off, or certainly not. But <laughs> I, no, but I, but I would genuinely think um, about whether this career is is for you, only because actually the hardest part of being an actor that I find is, is not the acting work. Um, you know, I'm sure all of your students are fabulous actors they have you as a teacher oh, <laughs> but, um, they're all no, shaking their heads right now <laughs> but actually it's it's the in-between jobs mm. so thinking about sort of the longevity of a career there's uh, you know probably 90 
98% of actors will also have other jobs to do in between acting jobs. And it's working the whole lifestyle of being an actor um, or dancer or singer or, you know, p- performer in general. It's the, the, the difficult bit isn't the acting. It's not the performing. That's what you love to do. That's you thrive at that. That's, that's the fantastic bit about being a performer. It's all the out of work bits. It's the, working in a shop, working in a call centre, doing all sorts of other jobs just to sustain bills and food and essentials. So I wouldn't, I would never want to put anybody off a career in performing arts because like I said, I do think it's wonderful and, you know, that's why we all do it because we love it. But I, I can't, can't sit and say it's a particularly stable lifestyle, if I'm honest. Like my, my you know, my sister... Um, grew up performing exactly the same as I did and when it came to her sort of you know after she finished her A-levels she was sort of deciding what to do and she thought about potentially auditioning for drama schools and then she was like nah I couldn't <laughs> couldn't have your lifestyle <laughs> <laughs> but she's lucky she still works in the industry she she works for um, a very big theatre producer but works on sort of you know an admin role which which she loves mm. so that would be my only thing but then you know you know you can go to drama school and not even come out of it and want to be a professional performer you know drum skill just oh, yeah. gives a lot of skills just in terms of communication and confidence and things like that so not a bad option at all let's talk a little bit about um auditions then how do you actually go about finding auditions what's your uh, kind of process do you go through an agent or do you find them on your own or uh, a bit of both I'm very lucky I do have an agent um my agency that I'm with is, is run by two women and they are they're very wonderful um so I'm listed on Spotlight which is um probably the biggest casting directory uh in this country and then my agent is also listed on there and I'm listed underneath them as one of their clients probably the main way that I find work um other than that, there are other casting websites um, that I use, things like um, mandy.com. Uh, I don't yeah. use it, but there's, I think, Star Now. Um, they work, you know, over a sort of a sim- similar principle. Um, then what else do I do? i tell you what, actually, I've, I have actually got a couple of jobs this way, um, is by writing to people directly. This happened yeah. with your last job, didn't it? it Tell us about it, that. It, it did. It did. With my last job, I I wrote to uh, a director who basically my not my last job, my job before that. Um, this director had just happened to be in the audience one night, so had, had seen me perform really randomly, like completely out the blue. And so uh, afterwards, he he came up and just sort of introduced himself, said hello, you know, we enjoyed the performance and what have you. And so a few months later, I saw that this director was doing something in the West End. Um, and I wrote to him and just said, oh, you know, I came to see your uh, show in the West End. Like, you may not remember me, but I met you X amount of months ago when you came to see my little show that I was doing. <laughs> um, and I got a really lovely reply. And he was like, Oh yeah, of course I remember you. And I, I'd, I'd also sort of sent him a link to my CV and said, "Oh, you know, be great. Like, I'd love to work with you, please." <laughs> um, and he replied saying that he was just away on holiday, but he'd uh, he'd like to have a coffee when when we get back. So I was like, "Oh my goodness!" I, and then I thought, oh, maybe he's just being polite, you know. <laughs> anyway, he uh, he got back from holiday, and then he uh, he got back in touch and said. Uh, you know would you, would you sort of like to meet up so I did um, and it was really great we just chatted for you know half an hour an hour or so and he told me about a project that he was in the process of casting at the minute and that he was directing um, sort of later in the year and asked if I would be interested at which point I nearly fell off my feet <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> ah! um, so yeah, so and 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 I did, and I, I took the job, and I went on tour last year, and it was it was amazing. But that that all stemmed from me uh, just writing to him. What's the process of going up for an audition then? What do you would you normally expect to happen in the room? So uh, so generally before an audition, I'll get a call, usually from my agent, saying um, you know you you've got uh, this job has come up, we've submitted you, you've been called in for an audition. It's 
this place, this time, and this is what you need to prepare. And usually they've sent over sides um, of the script. So they might have sent over an excerpt of the script that they'd like you to prepare. Um, I always, 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 if possible, learn the script. They always say you don't need to and that the signs will be available for you in the room to read, which is fine. But I, this is a completely personal thing. But I find that if I go in there, having prepared as much as I can, then I've already sort of put myself in a, in a nice sort of confident position because there, mm. there's so much in the room that you, that you can't control. But the things that I can control are the things they've asked me to prepare. So I will work my bum off if, if it's possible it might not be possible because it might be a new player but if it's already a published player try and read the play if you can try and prepare um the sides the script as much as you can um sometimes they'll ask you for a song uh quite often i go up for acting musician jobs so they'll ask me to um play pieces on my instruments so I'll quite often take those along occasionally there's a dance call uh, i tend not to go in for dance round auditions just because they're not the sort of jobs that i go for anymore but in the past i have been to go to a, a dance call where you turn up and there are 300 of the girls that look the same as you <laughs> yeah, they're always fun but then generally when you get into the room I, I tend to find the majority of people that i audition for are really lovely people and at the end of the day they're just trying to find they they honestly want you to do well because it makes their job easier as well if somebody walks in there and nails the audition then it's just exactly what they're looking for that's you know that really helps them out a lot as well yeah so I tend to go in people are really friendly have a little chat they, Quite often we'll ask about what I've been up to, what I've been working on, um, and then they'll ask to see my pieces. Um, yeah, I don't mind auditioning. I used, I used to get really, really nervous about it, and especially with, like, rejection and stuff like that, because 99 times out of 100, I get a no, which, when I first graduated, freaked me out so much. I was like, I'm never going to work. But, I get, you know, I, I sort of get used to it now. <laughs> <laughs> <That's not laughs> <for> me. <laughs> it but, strikes me that maybe half the job is is learning how to be resilient and deal with rejection in that way I guess oh my goodness so much so much so now honestly I you know I go in I do the audition and then I try to just completely forget about it until I hear whether it's a you know a yes or a no if it's a no eh, move on to the next one it's fine you know try not to you can't you can't let it get you down it's you know no, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. If you let it get you down, then you're kind of you're already halfway to losing the battle, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And you can't take it personally either. Like I say, it can be down to like so much, you know, things that you just cannot control. Like mm. you're not quite the right height or you know, anything. You know, I mean, literally, eye color, hair color, things that you know that didn't wouldn't seem to matter to us in every day, but when it yeah. comes to casting something, absolutely, yeah. So when you're going um, between jobs, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but how do you actually, personally, how do you maintain yourself when you're not working? And then when you are auditioning, how do you fit work around that? Oh, good question. Tricky. Um, how do I maintain myself between auditions? It can be hard. It can be really hard. So I, I work, when I'm not acting, I usually work three or four jobs at the same time. And finding the time to you know sort of work on work on your acting um can be tricky but I I, I try to I try to read plays um that's my little thing that I try to do uh pick a play and you know read a scene a night um type of thing just so that I'm trying to keep up to date and learn more plays and because you never know when something might come around and they're like oh well, you've got an audition for this and it's like oh I've already read it great and also similarly with um like t you know tv shows and films watch things because I feel like you can learn a lot by just by watching actors and then when an audition comes in um so I'm very upfront with my employer that I am primarily an actor so I am going to get auditions in where I might only be able to give you 24 hours notice that, oh, I'm really sorry, I need to go to an audition tomorrow. Um, there are um, there are jobs though, that allow you to do this. Um, I've been quite lucky working in, uh, I used to work quite a lot in retail or through an agency though, so that if I couldn't go in one day, they can get somebody else to, to cover me. Um, at the minute I do a bit of teaching assistant work in a school. Um, I'm very lucky the head teacher is very understanding and will allow me to say I have an audition in the morning, I can go off and do my audition and then perhaps come straight in afterwards. 
I just think be honest as well with your employer because if your mm. employer doesn't know that you're an actor and that you may get jobs uh, auditions coming in then they're suddenly going to be like oh what do you mean you can't come in on Thursday and and actually there are a lot of employees that in, that like to employ actors because like I say we have a lot of skills you know confident talking to people but usually like good in sales positions and customer facing roles um that you find a lot of employees find that a very attractive quality um in an employee so i think if you're just honest with them and and say you know i might not be able to come in the odd day here and there because i might have auditions i might have to leave early because I'm, i suddenly get a job you know uh, people are people are understanding and you know um, yeah they want to help you don't they yeah yeah they, they do and they get it like we all got bills to pay do you know what yeah. i mean um so then how do you motivate yourself and get yourself into the right headspace when you're going into an audition i imagine that's probably quite something to do especially if say you have just come from work or you know you've had a a bad morning at home how do you brush all that aside and get yourself ready to actually become someone else in that room it can be hard like you say if you've had you know you've had a bad morning you've had an argument with your partner you you've run out of cat food and you've you're running late and you've missed the bus and it do you know what I mean life happens like that is that's normal that you know we all go through things um and we are all human beings at the end of the day so things will happen I try as much as possible to to leave that at the door when I go into an audition which is sometimes a lot easier said than done um but I really try to think right this is this is me now this is what I do this is my number one sort of priority at the minute. Um, so I'll forget about the fact that I left all my washing in the machine over now and now I've got to wash it again because it stinks. Do you know what I mean? I'll, <laughs> I'll forget about that. And <laughs> I'll walk into the room. And um, and again, I think that comes down to your preparation as well. So, you know, if I've managed to learn the script, uh, you know, ahead of time, I can walk in there thinking, Right, okay, whatever happens that has happened this morning, I know that for those 10 minutes, 15 minutes whilst I'm in that room, I'm prepared. I've learned the script, I'm prepared. Um, and I've done all that I can to prepare myself. That's all you can do, isn't it? Well, yeah. That's great. Thank you. That's really, really interesting to hear about how you go about doing that. Mm. Um, okay, so let's talk about um, when you get a job. So kind of in rehearsals, all that sort of thing. Um, once you've got the job that you've auditioned for, yeah. How do you prep for the role? What do you do? That's, that's the best feeling. When you get that call saying you've got the job, it's like, hallelujah. See, top quality singer there. Um, <laughs> firstly, it depends on what the role is. Um, I've been I've been really lucky to, I have worked in musical theatre um, and I have worked in straight plays. So I feel really lucky to, to have done both. But how I would prepare for the role differs or certainly has differed between the jobs that I've done so if I'm I'm talking just just about acting uh, so when I get the script through first thing I do is just read it and enjoy it I try to layer up I do things that that I was taught to do at drama school like you know you give them circumstances and I try to you know filter through the script looking for little pieces of, of information that are going to help me you know, anything about where a character was born, their background, where they grew up, who they know, what relationship do they have to other characters within the play. I try to sort of create, this is before rehearsals have began, I try to create a whole sort of information pack for myself sort of thing. Um, I generally don't start to learn lines until I've got into the rehearsal room because things may change in the rehearsal room. And I like to, for me personally, I like to learn lines sort of as I go along with the movement that I may be given um, and with the direction that I may be given. Um, so I always enjoy like a first day as well of a rehearsal when you get in there and you do the first read through with everyone and, you know, you hear everybody's different characters because then that influences the way that you may say a line, the, may you, the way you may react, um, you know, to a certain character that you hadn't perhaps thought of before, but you're getting something from the other actors, which I think is really interesting yeah it's always important to feed off that isn't it yeah absolutely absolutely sort of contrasting to that so when I've uh, when I was a swing in a musical theatre so a swing is somebody who will cover um a few different roles usually ensemble roles um or tracks if you will so uh as a swing 
I was covering four different tracks in a musical. Um, so I was an offstage swing, which means I wasn't, I didn't go on. I wasn't in the show unless somebody was off ill. Um, and then there was sort of a hierarchy of understudies. Um, and then a swing would then cover an ensemble track. So for that preparation was very different because in that scenario, I don't really get to work directly with the director so the director will work with sort of your main cast and then as a swing it's up to you basically to to learn it sort of in your own time so it's 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 a tricky job being being a swing I think you need to be quite sort of organized and I used to have like a a whole notepad with like highlighters and colored pens and (laughs) that person goes that way at that time and, and that person does this and da 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 and sort of building a whole sort of patchwork of the show together, depending on which role you had to go on and cover. Um, so again, so my preparation for that was quite different. It was a lot more uh, sitting in the rehearsal room and watching what the, the principal cast were doing so that if I had to cover that role, okay, so that's how I would do it. And that's what the director wants. And it's almost you learn by watching the other person as opposed to, when you are sort of the principal role, you're working directly with the director, if that makes sense. So, so you know, your preparation sort of depends on on the role that you're that you're doing, I guess. No, absolutely. And have you ever found yourself in a position, or is it possible for you to to go on in the role as a swing and then think, oh, well, actually, I want to play this role differently, or or do you have to play it as the original person has done it? There is there is a little bit of scope in terms of we're all human beings and we're all different anyway so it it will be there will be a difference in it because you are a different person so it's not a carbon copy of what they've done but no you're generally trying to stick to what the you know what the director has given to that role what um you can't no I wouldn't I would never as a swing sort of deviate too much I wouldn't suddenly start changing you know the intention of the lines things like that of course there will be you know there will be a little bit of difference because you are a different person but no generally I would always try to give a truthful performance in the role the way in which it has been originally directed what's your experience really I guess of the relationship between the actor and the director in those moments kind of um as a swing and as a main role, well, I know you said that they didn't really have much to do with the swings. Yeah, in a sort of in a in a principal role, um, you're very much working alongside the director. You really have sort of a one on one, you know, connection with them as as you try to create the piece almost together. So you know, you can bring ideas certainly to the role as as an actor, um, and the director will of course have have their sort of overall vision for the piece. Um, so you're certainly working right alongside the director to, um, to, you know, to steer where the piece is going to go and alongside, you know, your, your other fellow actors as well. Whereas as a swing, it was very much more independent work to recreate that role that, that the director has worked on with the principal actor. So how do you deal with constructive criticism, if you like, as an actor in the rehearsal room then? <laughs> constructive criticism. Um, I really, I, th- I think importantly, I, don't, I really try not to take anything personally. I think that's a really useful thing because if you start thinking that these are, you know, any sort of criticism is, is personal, you know, to you as a person, it's it's just going to send you down a, a spiralling staircase, you know. Um, at the end of the day, when you're there everybody just wants to make the piece as good as possible you know yes if something's not working tell me about it I want to make this better so anything that I can do and something sometimes you know I'll be doing things that I'm not aware of and the director will be like oh maybe like actually I was in a rehearsal once and I kept for some reason I'm sort of like swinging my arms I don't know why I don't know if it was like a nervous thing or what and the director was like um maybe just tone down the arm swinging didn't even know I was doing it (laughs) so so um I very much I'm I personally am very very open to um you know to to constructive comments and and things like that um so I just try to I, I try to take them on board and hopefully that makes the piece better generally that's a really good answer. Thank you. Very diplomatic of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then final question on kind of the rehearsal period. What would be, have you got kind of any helpful tips for students for the rehearsal process? Like what, what are the key things that you would suggest to 
to do to prepare um just everyday working within the space as well what's kind of the protocol do you think that, mm. that would be good to share be on time do i mean i know i said this is an absolute basic but you wouldn't believe you know the amount of people that, that aren't on time then it just pushes everything back so get there early i mean not not even on time you want to get there early make sure you've got yourself nicely warmed up and you are ready in the space you know ready to work um and again it's about leaving that thing at the door you know anything perhaps you have been running late that morning as soon as you get there you know brush it off okay you've been late apologize you know get in there get yourself ready to work i like to get there like I say, a, a good sort of half an hour, 20 minutes early, have a warm up, you know, make sure I've, you know, said hello to people. And and so that all that is sort of out the way when it comes to, OK, now it's time to work. Um, do your preparation. Don't I wouldn't say, I don't think you need to overlearn stuff. I wouldn't personally. I, I don't think you need to turn up there being off book you know day one that's perfectly reasonable to you know to learn your line sort of as you go along but then if you are given a deadline by a director okay I'd like everybody off book by this point then then you know do it put your homework in um you know I've, I've been in you and again it, it also depends on the length of your rehearsal process sometimes I've been in a room I, I did one show um where I think I had about four days to learn an entire show but that was an awful lot of I was finishing rehearsals going home and then I'd be working till 11 o'clock midnight on my own just trying to piece things together so I'm not saying I'm not saying that's not you know that's not generally the norm but you know you don't have an infinite amount of time of rehearsal period so so you know be as prepared as as you can be and and I think I always think as well just like a, a you know a general good attitude a you know good sense of humor like it you know again people want to work with people that they can get on with and and have a laugh with and and again know know when the time is to yeah have a bit of banter have a bit of laugh you know stick the kettle on and have a brew lovely and then know when the time is okay that's over now let's you know let's crack on we've got a job to do um yeah so I think just generally sort of reading the room like that is is important as well no absolutely I totally agree with that mm. okay so let's uh talk about your touring experience then mm. so obviously you've done quite a bit of touring with both acting and musical theatre yeah so how long does a tour last roughly um again this this can vary so I've done tours that have been sort of a couple of months maybe eight weeks um up to tours that have I think my longest tour was about 10 months um but then I know of other comp companies that people have toured for you know 18 months two years so it really can vary um depending on perhaps the the scale of the production um the size of it you know whether it's a, a big you know sort of West End style musical um and again it, and, and that also depends on how long you're in a venue so again I've done shows where we've been in one venue for perhaps two or three nights and then we've moved to the next theatre um again some of the bigger musicals you might be static in one place for a month and then you move on to the next theatre so you know there, there can be quite a bit of variety in that so it must be quite a uh, just a, a weird life being on the road mm -hmm. all the time. so what does a normal week look like on tour so in terms of sort of weekly touring which is probably I'd say the most common type for sort of for musicals you know so you might get to get to the city wherever you are on on the Monday and I check into me digs that I've booked for that week usually some room in somebody's house um and then go to the theatre um so say say for instance if this was show was opening on a monday so the the crew might have been there on the sunday and all day on the monday you might turn up on the monday afternoon as the cast um and generally you would do a sound check so that would be everybody into their microphones and you might if it's a musical you might sing a song all together from the show um you might speak some of your lines it's just a sound team can 
um, I guess, adapt their sound levels to the theatre that you are in. Because, of course, if you're touring your theatre, the space is going to be different every week. The other thing you'll do is your lighting specials. So if the lighting, you know, say for a particular scene, somebody is stood in a specific spotlight, you would do all the lighting specials. The lighting team will bring up those particular lights so that you know exactly on that stage where you are supposed to be stood. And then stage management might come round put a little mark on the floor so it's easy for you to pick out during the show so you do all sort of like a technical you almost do like a mini sort of technical rehearsal um each week when you're when you're touring to different venues um and then obviously monday night would you know for example sometimes not always a monday sometimes tuesday be your opening night um and then sort of for the rest of the week obviously depending on what your show's uh, looking like usually you do six evenings a week so say monday to saturday and then you'll do a couple of matinees so wednesday and saturday so your two show days are generally obviously your longer days um quite often you'll have an understudy rehearsal once a week so perhaps a thursday where you'll be in all afternoon people who are understudying um different roles in the show you go in and do a rehearsal once a week. Um, other than that, you usually turn up, you know, sort of a standard night, say a Tuesday night, you turn up at probably about five o'clock, um, sort of an hour's warm up, and um, talk through any notes from the previous show with like your dance captain, your musical director, um, anything that needs looking at. You might run a couple of numbers when you've got the full cast there with people in understudy roles. Um, and then, yeah, and then you get your half hour call, start to get ready, and then off you go. Sounds like quite a hefty schedule then, actually. It, it can be. I always, I always thought too, and I thought, oh, it'd be great. You know, you do, you, you know, you just work your evenings. But actually, there's, there's not. There's generally it can be quite a lot of stuff to do during the days. Mm. You know, um, during the week. Oh, with that, then, how mm. do you, how do you maintain staying healthy? I guess you know, eating right and mm. and working out, making sure that you're still. I guess, able to to do the show to its best abilities? It's, yeah, it, it can be tricky. I mean, um, I, I tend to try and find whichever city I'm in. I try to find a gym nearby. Um, quite often, local gyms will do you sort of, you know, if you explain, you're just here for a week working on the show. It can be quite understanding. They might do you like a week's pass um, so that I get to go to the gym. Um, cooking can be can be tricky because if you're not in sort of self-contained digs, if you're living in somebody's house, it's sometimes a bit awkward. You don't want to use, you know, the kitchen all the time. Um, although I have to say, most people that do digs are, are, are again are very understanding. Um, I tend to also, I, I tend to a friend of mine did this, and I was like, oh, I'm going to do that because that's a good idea. She used to tour just like a little kitchen box, so like in there she would just have things like salt and pepper. You know, just like normal things that you would have at home. But obviously when you're living out of a suitcase, it's, you know, that's taken up room for another outfit for a night out. So what's uh, what's the most fun thing about touring? For me, it's it's the tra- the travel part of things. Like I, I feel really lucky that actually I've, there's not, mm, there aren't many places in like the UK that I haven't been to now. Um pretty much been to all the big cities and and that's really nice and um you know and you do you do get a little bit of time to to be able to explore you know each place every week you know you go you know you, you know like oh we're in Manchester in two weeks time that's going to be great for shopping and you know things like that and I also I also like as well um like when you go to your hometown that's always a really nice one so I'm from the northeast and there's I remember like the first first time I ever toured to Sunderland um like the, the big Sunderland Empire was the theatre that I went to as a kid to see all of the touring shows and if you'd have told you know seven-year-old Stephanie that one day she'd be performing there and, and, and getting paid for it that must have been a great feeling actually to be able to go back and go yeah, yeah that's me I made it yeah no it, it was it was yeah it was lovely when you're on tour for so long how do you keep everything that you do on stage still feeling fresh and and not kind of I know it's becoming a bit boring for yourself unfortunately the reality is is that it it can become as much as you think it's never going to you do this you know you do the same show eight shows a week for 10 months you know it it can it does have that danger of becoming a little bit stale um you know and obviously but then you have to think you know your audience every night the paying audience has never seen this show before majority won't have seen the show before so you want to keep it fresh for them you know um uh, you want to keep the standard high as well um 
sometimes that'll happen naturally if you're suddenly you know somebody will be off and then you've suddenly got an understudy on and then everybody's oh sort of keeps everybody on their toes a little bit because we've got somebody new on and things like that so sometimes naturally that'll happen but other than that I think it's about your your technique as, as an actor and and being able to to rely on your good technique to still be able to give a, a hopefully a, a, a good polished performance um yeah and and, and trusting in your, yourself as well that that you can do it and you know mm. you can do a, a good job Absolutely. Um, so then kind of moving on from that, how do you deal with being away from friends and family for so long? I imagine it can get quite lonely out there on your own. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and again, that's that's part of or can be part of the, the lifestyle of an actor, another another obstacle to overcome. Um, thankfully, you know, these days with, with video calls and everything like that, it's, um, you know, I, I still speak to my family and friends as much as possible um, and wherever possible as well if I'm not too far away I'll always try to get home for my one day off um, so I live in London at the minute and if I have a Sunday off if I'm not too far away I'll try and get home after the show on a Saturday night quite often you find that <laughs> curtain will come down Saturday night 10 o'clock bam it's like everybody's like you know stripped off clothes on in their car and you know straight onto the motorway to to get home and what kind of impact does that have on you kind of, I guess, socially with, with friends mm-hmm. and people? Do you find that as an actor, there's a certain element of you having to give up other elements of life in favour of doing your job sometimes? Yeah. They, yeah. Unfortunately, yes, there can be. Um, I've, I've missed weddings before. Um, you know, I've missed birthday parties before because, you know, people get married on a Saturday or throw parties on Saturdays and yeah you, you do unfortunately there is an element of, of missing out because you are working hours that are classed as social hours you know evenings and weekends so yes there can be that element and I've also I've also had it before well I tend not to ever book holidays in advance um because you can guarantee some sort of job will come up um but I did actually last summer I, I, I booked a holiday me and my partner booked a holiday and then about four weeks before we were due to go, I got a call from an, from my agent saying somebody has uh, had to pull out of a show and the director is looking to recast and wants to know if you're available. And then I was like, oh, OK, so I now, and I now need to make a decision about whether I take this job or whether I have my holiday. And whilst that might seem like an easy decision, like, yeah, of course, I'll, just, I'll take the job, I'll just cancel my holiday but then you've also got to think of the other p- people that that impacts like like your partner like your friends like your family you know it, it does have a knock-on um effect so in in the end to that I did actually say I was like okay tell him I am available and then he ended up going somebody else anyway so, <laughs> so I didn't get it anyway but you know those decisions do come along every now and again where you, where you do have to decide uh so so you also work as a stage manager every now yeah. and again um so are there any benefits to working in both fields as an actor and a stage manager? Well, when I first, I basically sort of got thrown into stage management. Um, so I got I got hired one job as an assistant stage manager slash swing. So I was uh, I was an off stage swing. So like I said earlier, I was covering different tracks in the show, and then so the nights that I wasn't on performing, they asked if I would be an assistant stage manager. Um, and I'd never done it before, so I didn't really know what I was getting into. But of course, I was like, "Yeah, of course, yeah, I'll do anything. I just need a job." So, <laughs> so I said yes, um, and then I sort of just dove in at the deep end and had to learn as I go. But I tell you what, it's probably one of the best things I've ever done in terms of learning about how. And it sounds daft, but how a theatre works. Like I didn't, as an actor, I didn't, I'd never done any sort of training in in technical theatre or or stage management, and I really didn't know almost what the responsibilities were of everybody's jobs, particularly within the crew. Um, and so and so I did learn, and I had to learn quickly. Um, and I'm so glad that I did learn because it's given me a pre- an appreciation of what everybody does and also I hate to say it but sometimes the attitude that actors can have to 
uh, crew is is not always great, I have to say. And, and having, I am an actor, but I've also been on the receiving end of not great attitude. <laughs> um, and it's really interesting because actually, you know, everybody within a theatre production really does have such an important role. If that person wasn't there, you'd sharp know about it because things wouldn't, you know, get done. I basically, I learned a lot from doing stage management. And then funnily enough, that job, since I learned those skills, that has also led on to other stage management jobs. So then I've done jobs where I've I've worked just purely as a stage manager, um, which I never expected. And I tend to, if I can, fit sort of little stage man- management jobs in between sort of my acting jobs. Um, again, it you know, it pays the bills. I'm still in the theatre. It's still something that I enjoy doing. Um, but I wouldn't have ever learned those skills had I not been sort of suddenly thrown in at the deep end with, with ASMing. That's very cool to and kind of see that there is a way that you can connect to both with mm. so do you yeah. think that doing both has changed when you're being a stage manager does that change the way that you deal with the cast or you know or the way that you as an actor deals with stage management as well so much just things like um and again this this isn't all actors but I have had actors come up to me when I've when I've been stage managing and almost demanded things from me so sort of been like you know, where's this? Well, oh, can you get this for me? And as a stage manager, like you're not you're not there to to pick up after you know everybody else or act after the actors. You're there to to do a job. And so I myself am very very respectful of the job that stage management do, and not just stage management, all all crew. You know, I'm very respectful of the job that everybody does. Um, and it has made me just simple things like you notice it when. Um, as, as an assistant stage manager, I was responsible, like I said, for the for the props on the show, so making everything was in the place it needed to be at the time it needed to be, okay? Um, and sometimes when the actor would take a prop on with them, they might then come off, off stage with the same prop, but then they would just leave it sort of anywhere. So then I'm running around at the end of the show trying, trying to find these rogue props, you know, um, which just makes the the job of stage management a little bit harder. So I'm I'm very much you know me as an actor. If I've used the prop on stage, I come off, and you know I put it back you you know in in the wings. That's pretty sort of standard practice. So I'll always bring my prop off and then just simply put it you know into its designated place on the props table, and then I know that that's just made stage management's life you know a little bit easier. Um, I mean, you know, just very, very simple things, you know, not not asking a lot. But I think I think work, being able to work together like that, actor and stage management, it just makes everybody's life easier. Yeah, I think that's kind of vital. I mean, I know one of the things that that we uh, as a college always try and promote is that really good, healthy working relationship yeah. between all our, you know, the various depart- areas of the department, in fact. But yeah, one of the, the big things that we do try and, and foster between them is the ability to communicate. And sometimes that's harder than, than it, you know, you might necessarily want it to be. But what would be, say, just one or two tips for you on how to engage and work with a member of the production team? I think having a good understanding of what everybody does. So, you know, if you're not sure what somebody's job is, you know, try and learn, ask them. People, people are, you know, I generally find people are really happy to help. You know, if you've got a question about something, I don't think anybody ever minds you just saying, oh, do you mind me asking, do you mind me asking about that? Why, why, like, why is it you do that? What's that important for? You know? Um, and I think generally sort of as, as an industry, by, by being able to understand each other, it just makes everything run so much smoother. You know, just just I think just being respectful of everybody's um, role within within the theatre is is really important. Great, that's that's really helpful. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening out there very intently to that little <laughs> reminder there as we come to FMP season, essentially, yeah, especially. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the situation that we find ourselves in right now. Yes. Um, this this lockdown, what advice would you give to students who are still in the middle of their training having this this mm. break? What should they be doing now to to kind of help them develop those skills and keep growing as a performer? I think anything that you can 
work on on your own, you know, reading plays, watching films, watching television, which is like the best homework in the world, by the way. <laughs> um, but, you know, try and um, try and do things that will that will keep yourself interested. Try and, you know, update your monologues, try and learn new songs, um, you know, anything that you can practically do. Um, I know you said about sort of your, your first years earlier on, you talked about them sort of building their repertoire. So maybe now would be a good time to actually sit down and have the time to to think, OK, right, maybe I'll maybe I'll listen to a new musical this week, you know see what songs are in it are there any songs that are suitable for you um i did however read also another really great article um i can't remember where it was now and it said don't worry as well if you don't feel creative every single day and i actually i think that's also a really important message yes do what you can when you have the motivation and you feel like you can do it and absolutely thrive in those moments but also realise that this is a really weird time for everybody, for us all. And if there's one day you wake up and you think, oh, I just, uh, just can't today. Even if you, you know, if you can get out of bed, make your bed, and then you know, sit in front of the TV and drink tea and eat biscuits all day, <laughs> that's okay to do too. And and, and do your college work. And course. do and do your college work. <laughs> and do your college. Work. Yeah, I should add that in. <laughs> um, no, so I mean, don't get me wrong. So, so you, you know, not doing that every day. Do try and keep yourself motivated, but also don't be too harsh on yourself that you have to be this creative soul seven days a week. Yeah, you know, you know, you're a human being. If you need a day to chill, then chill. Absolutely. That's all the questions that I have for you today. So, thank you very, very much for doing this interview for us. You're it's been very really useful. Oh, good, good. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, we'll speak to you again soon. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.